1296 had proved a calamitous year for the battered kingdom of Scotland. Four years before, King Edward I of England had judged John Balliol as the rightful King of Scots, but in doing so, never missed an opportunity to undermine and humiliate John in the years leading to 1296. By 1295, the Scottish lords took matters into their own hands, forming a council to effectively rule on Balliol's behalf and forging an alliance with England's enemy, the King of France. Having extracted very public oaths of fealty from the Scottish King, as well as all the leading lords during the Great Cause period, Edward felt entirely justified in coming down on the Scots with brutal ease. In 1296, the Scots had been decisively bested in the Siege of Berwick and the Battle of Dunbar. Dunbar in particular had exposed Scottish inadequacies in the art of war, their charge against the English under John de Warren quickly devolving into a confused rout as their lines were broken by the terrain and the ordered English countercharge. Well, it's time for a remake of an epic classic. The Oregon Trail is back. Experience the trials and tribulations of the road to Oregon. You start off by assembling your party and gearing up your wagon with weapons, food, medicine, spare parts, and other provisions. And you'll need to carefully ration them, as the journey to Oregon will be long. I played the game for a few hours, and I faced tough choices, dangers, and unexpected situations. Each party member has their own strengths and weaknesses, so it was a challenge to have all of them survive blizzards, broken limbs, snake bites, exhaustion, starvation, and the dreaded dysentery. I had to make sure I have the needed tools to repair any damage to my wagon, and that my pack animals are healthy, rested, and fed to avoid getting stranded and doomed. Along the trail there are outposts and towns where I bartered for supplies or sold my pelts and fish for hard currency that I used to stock up on vital provisions. But money needs to be managed carefully, and not every town has what my party needs, so it's never easy. The best part is that, thanks to procedurally random selected events that are based on the decisions you make, no two adventures will be the same. Your decisions always affect your party and future game events, which makes the Oregon Trail insanely replayable. Check out the Oregon Trail by clicking on the link below and set out on an adventure into the unknown. Big thanks to the Oregon Trail for supporting our channel. Following Dunbar and King Edward's subjugation of the realm, Edward had appointed the aging Earl of Surrey as his lieutenant in Scotland. Yet, though a staunch supporter of his, King Surrey despised his new position. According to one source, the Earl ran afoul of the Scottish weather to the extent that he was actually based in the north of England. Unfortunately for the Scots, the absence of their governor did not translate into light rule. Perhaps the most hated man in the kingdom was Hugh de Cressingham, Edward's treasurer, who was based in Berwick. Unlike Surrey, Cressingham was zealous in his role of satiating Edward's perpetual need of money. Ordinary folk smarted at the confiscation of wool to be sold in Flanders to help fund their conqueror's war against the French. This anger was inflamed further by rumors that soon Edward would demand military service in his foreign war. For Edward, hammering the nobility into submission the previous year equated to subduing all folk as a matter of course. However, Edward had made a dangerous enemy in the Scottish Church, who opposed his appointment of English priests in their sphere. Such a network of educated men was the ideal conduit for communicating ideas of resistance against the hated occupiers. Robert Wishart, the Bishop of Glasgow, as well as James Stuart, plotted early on to foment revolt, proving immensely successful in this, as both men were closely linked with the most famous rebel of the period, William Wallace. It was Wallace's murder of the Sheriff of Lanark that signaled a wider uprising. Yet these lords were not idle themselves, 
raising the banner of revolt in the southwest. Also involved in this theater was the young Earl of Carrick, Robert Bruce. Bruce, unlike his staunchly pro-English father, threw his lot in with his own folk. However, this proved less a fire and more a whiff of smoke. The English under Robert Clifford and Henry Percy forcing their surrender at Irvine. A more successful campaign was waged in the Northeast under Andrew Murray. Murray would jointly command the Scots at Stirling Bridge and had already bloodied himself at Dunbar, where he had been taken and imprisoned in Chester Castle. Murray, though, had somehow escaped back north. Murray's Scots were initially beaten back when they tried to take Castle Urquhart. However, following this setback, he enjoyed a series of successes as the campaigning season progressed into the summer. While Murray had been conquering in the north, to the south a comparative nobody raises his head, at least according to the Scottish source Forden. There is little doubt William Wallace was a remarkable man, having either an aptitude for or experience of warfare, leading small bands of men as an outlaw before his meteoric rise in 1297. The action at Lanark in May of 1297 marked Wallace's first major act on the national stage. Blind Henry's account of the day had Wallace murder the sheriff of Lanark and kill his men in revenge for the death of Marion Braidfoot, William's wife or lover. However, the Scala Chronica states that the fighting began at a court presided over by Hesselrig. Wallace and his men slew the English and fired some houses. Following Lanark, Wallace joined forces with William, the Lord of Douglas, and raided Scone, this at the urging of Robert Wishart. Though they reoccupied the place, the garrison commander William de Ormsby evaded their wrath. Around this time, the aforementioned negotiated submission in the southwest was taking place. However, unlike these noble men, Wallace refused to submit and regrouped in Selkirk Forest. In August, Wallace's force headed north of the Forth, fighting the English through Perthshire and Fife, their target being the castle of Dundee. By this point, Wallace and Murray were in contact and well aware that an English force was marching north to crush them. The English response to these risings was muddled. Though Clifford and Percy had marched north, they had focused on the supposed greater threat of James, Bruce and Wishart, while Murray and Wallace had made steady gains elsewhere. Hugh de Cressingham was clearly not impressed, and in July had raised a sizable force of 300 cavalry and 10,000 infantry at Roxburgh. However, Percy and Clifford insisted on their way back south that all was well after the capitulation at Irvine. It was decided that no further action would take place until the Earl of Surrey himself arrived. Surrey, though, was hardly an inspiring presence. Already reluctant and old, he had even encouraged King Edward's attempt at replacing him, though his choice, Brian Fitzalan, pleaded poverty, claiming he was unable to oblige on account of the smaller salary he would receive. Surrey was thus stuck with the task of dealing with the Scottish menace. King Edward himself was firmly fixed on his war with France and had set sail for Flanders on the August 22nd. Meanwhile, Hugh de Cressingham awaited Surrey's arrival at Roxburgh. John de Warren arrived in the English capital of Berwick on the 28th of July, before riding to take command of Cressingham's army and heading north. Surrey's army made slow progress perhaps reflecting their commander's attitude towards the Enterprise, not arriving at Stirling until the second week of September. By the 10th of September, the pieces had been set. The key point of convergence for both sides was the imposing and strategically vital castle of Stirling. Stirling overshadowed both the town itself and the narrow wooden bridge that spanned the Forth. The geography of the area effectively cut the realm in two, 
this location proving the key to a landward invasion of the north. Stirling Bridge back then was a narrow crossing that could barely accommodate a horse and cart, meaning Surrey's men could only cross two abreast. The bridge itself connected to a causeway that led towards the Scottish position. In addition to the perilous prospect of crossing the bridge itself, Surrey's men would be hemmed into a meander of the fourth while deploying, which leaves us to wonder why he ordered the march across the bridge in the first place. Surrey halted in Stirling and surveyed the situation from his perch on the battlements, while James Stuart and the Earl of Lennox made their unsuccessful attempt to negotiate another Scottish climb down. Having ordered his men to ready for the morning crossing, Surrey retired for the evening, only to rise late the next morning and find his army already crossing without his order. The vanguard was ordered back, only to be halted a second time when news reached Surrey that Stuart and Lennox had ridden back into camp, perhaps with news of a Scottish submission. These lords bore no good news, and thus Surrey made a final attempt at peace by famously sending two Dominican friars to the Scots commanders on the Abbey Craig. Walter of Gisborough records the immortal response from Wallace himself. We are not here to make peace, but to do battle to defend ourselves and liberate our kingdom. Let them come on, and we shall prove this in their very beards. Despite these defiant words, both Surrey and Cressingham would be forgiven in doubting the ability of the Scots to match them with arms. To be fair to Surrey, he had personally witnessed the shambolic performance of Scottish arms at Dunbar, so must have assumed this force, under the less noble Wallace and Murray, would be easy pickings. Richard Lundy, a Scottish knight advising in the English camp, urged Surrey to allow him to ford the fourth further upstream to outflank the enemy and allow a safe crossing. Hugh de Cressingham disapproved of such an action, with an eye on the continuing expense of the campaign, having already sent men home at Stirling, the treasurer criticizing the waste of the king's money on vain maneuvers. Unfortunately for the royal army, Surrey heeded Cressingham and finally ordered the crossing of the bridge. To his credit, Cressingham was no armchair general, leading around a third of the English army across, some 2,000 men and around a hundred cavalry. Surveying events on the Abbey Craig, Murray and Wallace concluded their best chance of victory was to allow the vanguard to cross and attack at the point where they were most vulnerable, the Scots numbering around 6,000 spears, with a small complement of 400 longbowmen were massed around half a mile away. Advancing onto Cressingham's vanguard in tightly packed shiltrons, the Scots may have given the English food for thought as they ominously veered into view at a steady, deliberate pace. Wallace and Murray riding at the forefront, their ranks solid and disciplined, their pace increasing to charging speed. The battle rapidly devolved into a slaughter, the stationary English horse, useless, along with their packed archers, mingled with the infantry. The Scots enjoyed local superiority in numbers and bloodily scythed their way through the panicking English. Soon the exit to the rammed bridge was cut off, forcing many English to attempt swimming the fourth to safety. Around 300 Welshmen managed to reach safety, though the constable of Stirling Castle, as well as much of his men, were slain. For the Scots, the greatest prize of the day came in the form of rotund and despised Hugh de Cressingham, who was unhorsed and cut down while his men fell about him. One Yorkshire knight, however, Marmaduke de Thweng, quickly realized the day was lost and led the English heavy horse towards a breakout of the envelopment. Their charge proved effective in smashing through to the bridge, but his daring escape was also the last serious resistance in the English mass. In an irony, since Cressingham had taxed and sold Scott's property to help finance his royal master's war with France, the treasurer's corpse was itself laid pieces of his skin distributed as a prize among the victors. 
Yet Cressingham was not the only major casualty of the day, with Wallace's own co-commander, Andrew Murray, suffering a mortal wound, eventually dying around early November. The destruction of his vanguard dispirited both Surrey and the larger, unengaged portion of his army. With no stomach for the fight, the Earl broke the bridge on his side of the fourth and rode hard for the relative safety of Berwick leaving his lumbering army to tail him, while dogged by attacks from the newly reconverted Earl of Lennox and James Stuart. Stirling Castle itself was not provisioned for a sustained siege and soon crowned the Scottish victory, Wallace capturing it. By November of 1297, Andrew Murray's death effectively made William Wallace the uncontested leader of Scotland. Wallace, as the surviving commander, also emerged as the legend of the period, though his newly minted reputation and position would soon be challenged by Edward Longshanks himself. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as one dollar, or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.